So tonight, we got Dr. Rob Armstrong from St. Andrews University, and Rob is working on next generation batteries. Now, when I was looking around, looking for a speaker, I came across that, and I thought, hmm, that sounds really interesting, batteries. Yeah. So I asked Rob to speak, and he agreed. And then I get my usual pangs of doubt afterwards, and I'm thinking, is anybody going to be interested in batteries? What a boring subject, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but then we started to advertise it on Facebook and we got a big response. And you see this evening, we have a tremendous uh, room full of people here. Batteries is a kind of important subject. And recently, I, I see my news feed on Facebook and I look at articles that are published on sodium ion batteries, what Rob's going to be talking about tonight, and just over this past week or two, there have been a number of very significant announcements on progress in this area. So, tonight we've got a very topical topic. Is that right? Yep. Yes. A topical topic, okay, that Rob's going to speak about. Remember, we're going to be out here by nine. Over to you, Rob. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, I'm going to try not to walk out of range of the microphone, but I'll do it. It will happen. I apologize in advance. So, next generation batteries. I'm not particularly used to speaking to a general audience about batteries. Like Eric McCabe there, I do it about thirds, but not so much about what I do in my professional life. So, I'm going to start by Let's, batteries we all use, lithium ion batteries, how they work, what goes into them, and a key question, a key problem that's going to become extremely important in the next few years, lithium ion battery recycling and also reuse. Uh, if we don't do that, then we've got problems. So then I'm going to move on to what are going to power our devices out uh, of the future. So I'll look at a couple of high energy options, although if I'm running short of time then they might get cut. So lithium sulfur, lithium air batteries, which offer the possibility you can get a lot more energy than you get from your conventional lithium ion battery. And then stuff that we're doing, how to make more sustainable batteries moving from lithium to sodium. So, we're a very energy hungry society. Mm -hmm. Energy storage is more important than it has, ever has been. We're very familiar with using lithium ion batteries in portable electronics. <coughs> Most of you have got a lithium ion battery in your pocket or something. Um, <laughs> power tools. Uh, another very big application for batteries today. Didn't used to be lithium ion, gradually been taken over by lithium ion in the last 10 or 15 years. One you might not think about is batteries are widely used for medical applications, for uh, implants, for an example with the artificial heart here. But then, it might be called the two big ones, uh, electrification of transport, e-bikes, uh, electric vehicles, and one that's going to become a lot more important is storing energy from renewable power generation. Renewables are intermittent, they don't generate power when you want them necessarily, so you need something that will store the energy. Now, it doesn't have to be batteries. Uh, in fact, going forward, it's likely to be a whole range of different uh, solutions. But batteries are going to form a significant part of that. Bit of a, bit of a history lesson. Rechargeable batteries sort of started with the lead acid battery in the late 1850s. We still use them today, they're a very successful technology, although 
I suspect if you were inventing the lead acid battery today, <coughs> you'd never get it licensed because, <laughs> you know, lead, sulfuric acid. <laughs> so then we move on to things like nickel cadmium batteries, which were widely used in power tools. Can't use them anymore, cadmium's highly toxic. Um, nickel metal hydride, slightly better than NICADs. Again, similar range of applications, although they were also used in the first hybrid vehicles. Things like Toyota Prius had a, a nickel metal hydride uh, battery. And then the game changer lithium ion battery launched by Sony in the early 90s. And some of these are happening, like lithium ion based on nanomaterials. I'll talk about some of these, lithium ion phosphate. Some of these may happen, they may not. And lithium ion batteries are massively successful, but it took a very long time before anyone got the Nobel Prize for them. And they did it just in time, because John Goodenough was 97 when he was awarded the Nobel Prize, the oldest ever a Nobel laureate, and he should have had it decades before. So, how does it work? Well, this is what we call the positive electrode. It's typically a lithium transition metal oxide. So the first uh, lithium ion battery made by Sony used lithium cobalt oxide on the positive electrode. We have graphitic carbon as the negative electrode, so sheets of carbon. And when we charge the battery, we get lithium ions come out from between the layers of the lithium cobalt oxide. They pass through an organic lithium ion conducting electrolyte, and they go between the layers of the graphite. Now, then on the discharge, when we're using the battery to get energy from it, the reverse happens. So it's a very nice reversible bit of chemistry, what we call two reversible intercalation reactions. So I described the materials, so there's more to just that goes in a lithium ion battery than just what's in the electrode materials and what's in the electrolyte. So we've got various other components. Most, almost all commercial lithium ion cells have a liquid electrolyte, and for that you need what's called a separator. So it's a sort of porous membrane which you soak the electrolyte, <coughs> and it stops the two electrodes coming together and short circuiting. Most of our electrode materials are not electronically conducting enough. So we add a conducting additive, typically an amorphous carbon, just to make them more conducting. We've got powders for our electrode materials, so we need something to stick them all together. So we have a polymer binder <coughs> to ensure that we've got good good contact between the grains. And the binder also sticks uh, the electrode materials to what's called the current collector, which provides a form of rigid support, and it provides electrical contact to the external circuit. Now, for the positive electrode, this will be an aluminium foil or an aluminium <coughs> grid. If you're using graphite, as a negative electrode, then you use copper. And that's something I'll be talking about later. And you can have various different designs. You can have cylindrical cells, which uh, <coughs> happens to be what Tesla use in their battery packs, uh, which makes them unique. For other automotive manufacturers, they tend to use what's called prismatic cells or um, pouch cells, which are much larger format. 
and we've got things like button cells, which are what we what we use in the lab to test materials and so on. What do we use in a lithium-ion battery? Some of you may have seen this version of the periodic table before. It scales things by natural abundance and also color coded by whether there's a risk to the supply of that element. So if you look at cobalt, now lithium cobalt oxide, it's quite a small box here. There's not a huge amount of it, and there's a significant <coughs> risk to cobalt supply. Lithium itself, do we have enough of that? I'll come on to that later. So several of the elements that we might use in a lithium ion battery, we might have supply issues with. What makes a good electrode material? What do we want from it? And I'm going to talk specifically about positive electrodes here. Um, graphite is still very much the most widely used negative, and people are looking at others, but I'm not going to talk about them tonight. Well, great, yes, we want it to be cheap. Goes without saying. Toxicity. Depending on the application, we really do want non-toxic elements if possible. And that's where one of the areas where cobalt lets us down. Cobalt is really quite toxic. Um, safety. We've got to consider the safety of the battery as a whole and also some when we charge the battery up and so on, we're often creating elements in a state which they're not, uh, where they're highly reactive and they're not very safe. For example, cobalt, when you charge the battery up, you're forming cobalt 4 plus. Cobalt 4 plus is quite reactive. So, again, issues there. Voltage. By the voltage, the more energy we can get out of the battery. So, if we extract lithium from a <laughs> at higher voltage, then um, we can get higher energy. That comes with compromises. Often, the electrolyte material is not stable at high voltages. So, we have a series of compromises. Capacity, this is something I'm going to be talking about, mentioning quite a lot this evening. How much lithium can we store? How much can we take out? How much can we put back? And we can measure that both in terms of the mass of the electrode, so gravimetric capacity, which we measure in milliamp hours per gram of material, and volumetric capacity per unit volume. Cycle life, we don't want to keep replacing the battery every uh, few weeks. We want to be able to charge it up and discharge it hundreds, even thousands of times. Rate capability, how fast can we charge and discharge? Particularly if you're sitting in a motorway service station wanting to charge your electric vehicle, you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, you want to be able to charge quickly. So all of these are important parameters and depending on what application you're going to uh, use your battery for, then the relative importance of these changes. So let's have a look at some of these things on the atomic scale, what do they look like? Ish. Uh, so, if we look at the positive side, there are two main types of positive electrode used in lithium ion batteries. First one's layered oxides, like lithium cobalt oxide made by Sony, has this structure. We have octahedra, cobalt oxygen octahedra, which share edges, and we have lithium ions sitting in between. So when you charge it up, you can take the lithium ions out from between the layers. It's 
very successful, it's very reversible, but if you take out more than a certain amount of lithium, then it ceases to be quite so reversible. So typically that's about half the lithium in the structure. So that limits the capacity. Cobalt's quite expensive, cobalt's quite toxic. But Apple still use it in iPhones. Then people moved on to replacing cobalt by nickel. It would be nice if you could replace all the cobalt by nickel, but nickel likes to be nickel 2 plus. And nickel 2 plus is about the same size as lithium. So what happens is you get some nickel 2 plus going where the lithium should be. And that obviously makes it harder to get the lithium in and out. So nickel on its own, not so, not so successful, but if you mix nickel and cobalt, then you can get a material that works very well. Uh, and this is commercialized, and this normally has a small amount of aluminium, about 5%, which in terms of the battery capacity is doing nothing, but it does stabilize the structure, and it's typically called NCA. What people have done now, they've moved on to so-called NMC, nickel, manganese, cobalt, originally one to one to one, three to three to three, whatever. So the, in that case, the manganese wasn't doing anything, it was sitting as manganese four, which it likes to be. Uh, cobalt was going from three to four, as it does in the thing cobalt oxide, and nickel actually goes from two plus to four plus. As people want to reduce the amount of cobalt in the battery, people have been trying to change the composition, moving to what they call nickel-rich materials. <coughs> so nickel to manganese cobalt ratio is 622, and now they're really pushing to go to 811. So almost all nickel. In that case, you're using more nickel 3 plus to nickel 4 plus. But it's not it comes with problems. It's not, if it worked as well as lithium cobalt oxide, people could have done it some time ago. So people are working very hard at particularly looking at trying to reduce uh, the, the, re the reactions of this with the electrolyte to ensure that it gives you the cycle life that's comparable to lithium cobalt oxide. So I mentioned milliamp hours per gram, I'm going to talk about them a lot. Lithium cobalt oxide has a practical capacity of 130 at an operating voltage just under 4 volts. NMC operating voltage is about the same, maybe actually slightly lower, 3.8, but you can get usable capacities 180, 190. So that's the driving force to moving to NMC. This is the driving force for getting rid of cobalt. <laughs> Most of the world, world's cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo. A lot of it is from labor intensive, low tech mines, often with significant amounts of child labor. Cobalt's toxic, it's expensive. You're causing significant environmental damage with cobalt extraction. And you have this sort of significant transportation issues. That most of the mine owners in the Democratic Republic of Congo are Chinese. The cobalt ore is mined in Congo. It's taken to China for refining. Some of it's made into batteries there. Some of it's turned into batteries in Korea or Japan. Europe or the US. There's a lot of transportation involved in making lithium ion batteries. So those are the layered materials. Um, the other class is what's called polyamine materials. Um, the classic example is this one, lithium ion phosphate. In this case, instead of metal three plus to metal four plus, we got metal two plus metal 3 plus. 
And what the phosphate group does, it raises the voltage of that voltage process to something usable. 3.4, okay, it's not as high as lithium cobalt oxide, but it's still pretty useful. Um, I talked about mass and so on. Extra mass of the polyanion will give you, in theory, lower capacity, milliamp hours per gram. So we've got grams that are coming from phosphate groups instead of oxides. But, as it happens, because you've got this sort of open structure with tunnels for the lithium to go through, in fact, you can take out more or less all the lithium and put it back, which you can't do with lithium cobalt oxide. So, it's actually pretty competitive. The phosphate group means its electronic conductivity is pretty lousy. So you have to do clever things with it. So make it small particles so the lithium ions don't have to go as far. And do things like coat it with a thin layer of carbon to improve the electronic conductivity. But it has this huge advantage. Iron is the most abundant of the transition metals. It's also environmentally benign, it's non-toxic. So it's a strong driver to move to what's called, typically known as LFP. And for a long time, people didn't look at it for electric vehicles. They went, oh, most energy we can get. But actually, now LFP is becoming very widely used in electric vehicles. Um, people accepting, well, we don't have to pay people. We want people to buy electric vehicles. They, <coughs> they need to be affordable. I'm going to consider the negative electrode briefly. And obviously, if we were able to use lithium, we should get the highest capacity coming from the negative electrode and the lowest, the lowest possible voltage, because we're measuring everything against lithium. And the theoretical capacity for the lithium electrode would be huge. But lithium's an alkali metal that's uh, extremely reactive. Mm -hmm. And it reacts with the solvent. And when you charge it up and so on, so you get the lithium is stripped off the surface of the electrode, it goes into the electrolyte. And then when you deposit it again, you don't deposit it evenly to form a nice smooth surface, what you get is these sort of mossy dendrite structures. And what they do is they gradually grow out from the surface of the lithium. They go through your separator until they reach the positive electrode and form a short circuit. So using uh, lithium is a real challenge. And it's the main driver for <laughs> moving towards all solid state batteries, which is a very big research topic and not what I'm going to talk about this evening. Uh, it's a big challenge, particularly looking at the interface between the electrodes and the solid electrolyte. Toyota seem to think they cracked it. They're talking about producing uh, an electric vehicle with a driving range of about 750 kilometers, which will be marvelous, but it hasn't appeared yet. <laughs> so what we use is graphite. Uh, it's non-toxic, it's low cost, but graphite is a critical uh, material. Natural graphite is in relatively short supply, so you'd be making synthetic graphite. It requires quite high temperatures to produce good synthetic graphite, so maybe it's not the sustainable negative electrode you thought it was. You can intercalate lithium into graphite very close to the same voltage of lithium as lithium metal. So really 0.1 volts and below. Which maximizes the overall voltage of your battery. But it does have the downside that if you charge your battery up really quickly, the lithium, instead of going between the layers of the graphite, deposits on the surface instead. So then you've got this problem happening again. So that's the lithium ion battery and some of the good things and bad things about it. Um, 
Hmm. I'm not going to read all this out, but 2017, 180,000 tons of lithium ion batteries reaching end of life. Nearly all of those were from portable electronics. That's what you'd expect, there weren't that many electric vehicles on the road, still fewer reaching end of life. Once we move to full electrification, then you're going to get a heck of a lot more lithium ion batteries reaching end of life and the vast majority, particularly in terms of size of the battery, is going to come from electric vehicles. So then we start worrying a lot more about lithium supply and the need for a circular economy. So if we look at gradual growth in the number of lithium ion batteries put on the market in terms of uh, over the last, this stops at 2017, but over a 15 year period, you get this huge jump. So this one here corresponds to the use of, sudden use of electric buses in, in China. Now, one of the places in China that I've visited uh, quite a bit is the city of Shenzhen, just across from Hong Kong. They've gone large scale for electrification of transport there. The whole city taxi fleet in a city of 15, 20 million people is electric vehicles. So we all guilty of bad mouthing the Chinese, I think, for sort of the amount of coal fab, coal fire power generation and so on. They are in many ways leading the way when it comes to electrification of transport. So if we look at what goes in a cell and what we can recycle, so we've got the positive electrode material, which is on an aluminium current collector, the carbon material, which is on a copper current collector, the binder, some sort of polymer, the electrolyte solvent, conducting additive, conductive salt separator, and the cell case. So all of those, some of those we can recycle, some of those we can't. So at the moment, what we can recycle is less than 40% of what goes in the battery. Um, how do we do it? Well, what we do at the moment is mostly pyrometallurgy. Basically, you're heating it up to high temperature and you're recovering the metals. What's gradually being developed and uh, coming on stream at the moment is what's called hydrometallurgy, so it's sort of acid base reactions, and you'll be able to dissolve up the uh, electrode materials and recover far more of the components. But if you're going to recover a lot more, you need a system where you've got a lot more physical separation. You're able to take the cells apart and specifically separate bits, the <coughs> components of the cell. So there are all sorts of obstacles for that. You don't have mm -hmm. lithium ion batteries, particularly with that go into electric vehicles, are all different. There's no standardization either at the cell level larger scale at the battery pack level. We need some form of legislation that will enable you to, what happens when a car battery reaches the end of life? What, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to get it to a recycling centre and so on? These are all things that we need to consider. So, all makes it harder. So, I'm going to look at how can we make things more occur more easily? Well, what we're describing at the moment Pyrometallurgy, extract the metals, get some metal salts by hydrometallurgy, make our electrode materials again, make the electrode again, make it back into cells. Obviously, that's quite a, an involved process. Hydrometallurgy, well, we get the metal salts first go there, so we've taken one step out of the process. Direct recycling, take it apart get our active materials back, then we can remake them into electrodes and into cells. So we're, we're, making, we're making the circle smaller. And 
if you can have a situation where you take a battery and just refurbish it, uh, basically get the electrodes out, just put new electrolyte in, new separator, new cell casing, then that's, that's the best scenario. So here we are at the moment, somewhere between these two, recovering less than 50%. If we generate, get good hydrometallurgy, some elements are easy to extract that way. Manganese is quite difficult. Uh, obviously, I'm going to come on to lithium supply, but lithium is also quite challenging. So if we're going to be able to get full materials recovery, then we've got to just change the way we make cells in the first place. We've got to make the batteries with the aim of, aim of recycling at the end of it. There is another option, um, and there's a reason why this may not be the best option, but to work, keep working in an electric vehicle, you've got very high performance thresholds. Typically, if you get below 80% of your initial performance, then no good. swap it for another one. <coughs> for other applications, they don't necessarily have such strict criteria. So we can say, OK, we can reuse electric vehicle batteries, for example, in grid or off-grid storage. So here's an example from South Africa, where they're taking end-of-life Nissan Leaf batteries and repurposing them to store solar energy. Now, that's great, but by doing, by moving lithium ion to grid storage, that may not be the best solution because you're then taking it out of circulation for making it into mm -hmm. automotive batteries. So to summarize, uh, recycling, we've got these various options. Now, when it comes to recycling, Teslas are awful. Tesla use cylindrical cells, little things like a AA battery on the figure. And they fit them into their packs in a honeycomb arrangement. Can you imagine how easy it's going to be to take those apart and recover all the components? I wouldn't fancy it. <laughs> so if you have a design like this, this comes from a Chinese manufacturer called BYD. And it's called the BYD blade. Here you have different terminals at different sides. So we've got all the negative electrodes connected at one side, all the positive electrodes connected at the other. This is really easy to take apart. You can recover the materials. <laughs> <laughs> extremely easily. And this sort of design is what you really need if you're going to be able to re recycle efficiently. So that's the lithium-ion battery and some of the challenges associated with it. I'm going to look at some other lithium battery chemistries that go... That <laughs> offer this tantalising prospect that you can get a lithium system that will give you 10 times the energy of a lithium ion battery. Well, maybe. So, here we are looking at the energy density of lithium ion and alternative chemistries. So, we've seen our lithium cobalt oxide, we can get 130, 140 milliamp hours per gram at 4 volts. Fine, great. If we move to something, either lithium sulfur batteries or lithium air batteries, we can get something which might give us over a thousand milliamp hours per gram. Theoretical capacity for lithium sulfur is something like 1600. For lithium air, it's much higher. So what we have here, we're going from this case where we go from graphite, lithium cobalt oxide to I'm afraid we're going to lithium metal again. 
and lithium peroxide. So the lithium air battery, strictly speaking, it's a lithium oxygen battery. So what we have, lithium metal, is a negative electrode. The positive electrode is a porous structure, ideally a porous carbon. And what happens is we take oxygen from the air, it combines with lithium to form <coughs> lithium peroxide in the pores of the positive electrode. And when we charge it up again, we disassociate the lithium peroxide back to oxygen and lithium ions. Great, it's just really difficult to do. Um, it's called a lithium air battery, but in order to work, it needs to be a lithium oxygen battery. Because there are things in air that will make this, that will cause all sorts of side reactions, particularly things like carbon dioxide and moisture. So you need a selective membrane so that you're only going to get oxygen going into your electrode. <coughs> The energy efficiency is pretty lousy. So you get, so you charge it up at quite a high voltage. The lithium on discharge is at a much lower voltage. So you've got this huge energy gap between charge and discharge. You're wasting a lot of energy. And they just don't cycle for long enough. But also, the main driver for working on lithium air batteries was range anxiety for electric vehicles. We can't go far enough, therefore we need some new chemistry that will give us more energy. And range anxiety will be a thing of the past. Well, engineers can do clever things with battery pack design, as well as chemists doing clever things producing electrode materials with higher capacities. So now you've got this, again it's BYD in China, doing a lot of innovations with a driving range of over 600 kilometers. For most people that will be good enough. You don't need to go to fancy chemistries that don't work properly. You can get what you need from lithium ion. Lithium sulfur is something that works quite a lot better. Uh, it's much more reversible. It's quite low voltage compared to a lithium ion battery, only just over two volts. And again, we have a lithium metal electrode, and we have the positive electrodes going from sulfur in the form of S8, and at the end of discharge, it's going to Li2S. And it in between, it goes through all these complex sulfides. And this is what the voltage profile looks like. You've got various challenges. The, the volume change going from sulfur to Li2S is about 80%. So when you're doing that to an electrode, the volume's changing, it's going to crack when you take the lithium out. Both sulfur and Li2S are electrically insulating, really electrically insulating. We need a lot of conducting additives, <coughs> a lot of very clever uh, electrode manufacture. And something that's unique to lithium sulfur is that as you go along here, reacting with lithium, you go to Li2S8, Li2S6, and so on. These are actually soluble in the electrolyte. That's a big challenge. Because that means it, the lithium polysulfides are free to go through the separator and go to the lithium electrode and deposit there. So you're losing sulfur when you do that. So this is a subject of a big research effort to get around it. One of the things you have is 
using so-called <laughs> redox mediators, something that will oxidize these soluble species so they don't end up on the lithium electrode. And you can get high capacity, 1,000 milliamp hours per gram, so a lot more than a lithium ion battery. So I um, defined these. C is a convention. 1C is full charge or full discharge in one hour. So typically something like C over 10 is nice slow charging, full charge in 10 hours. If you're sitting here, by the way, service station waiting for your car to charge, then you want something like 5C. You want, to be, you want it done in 12 minutes or something like that. So, okay, lithium. Hmm, okay, we've got problems with lithium. Lithium's not terribly abundant. I think it's something like the 25th most abundant element in the Earth's crust. Uh, and it's not uniformly distributed at all. So these are the world's largest lithium producers. Most of the world's lithium is produced in Australia at the moment. Australia does not have anything like the world's biggest lithium deposits. Most of them are in the Andes, in locked up in high altitude salt flats. So you have all sorts of geopolitical issues associated with lithium extraction. Uh, you have all sorts of environmental issues. Got a lot of damage to the groundwater and so on involved in lithium extraction. Uh, not good for flamingos. And at the moment, there's enough lithium globally. But if we have recycling, we probably have about enough for electrification of transport. If we're going to start storing electricity from renewables, then no, we probably don't have enough. And if we look at what the global price of lithium has done, particularly in the last couple of years, it's gone up by an enormous, more than a factor of 10. So. That sort of focuses the mind. So, why not look at sodium? What, what, what are we getting from looking at sodium? Well, sodium is much more abundant. It's about, in the Earth's crust, it's about the sixth most abundant element. It's also very evenly distributed, both crustally and obviously, <coughs> hey, we're an island, we can get lots of sodium from seawater. Um, so no problems with supply, we shouldn't have price volatility associated with sodium. We have to use copper as the current collector for graphite because of the voltage that you insert lithium into graphite, lithium forms an alloy with aluminium, which is not what you want. So sodium doesn't. So if we're going to use sodium, we can use aluminium both sides, which is a weight saving, it's a cost saving. We have no, no need to use cobalt at all. Even in, a, even in a layered system. So, if we look at what's called the bill of materials, even if we're using nickel and so on, we're sort of 70% or less the materials costs, even for lithium ion phosphate. Um, if we're comparing with lead acid, no toxic way. One of the features of using aluminium on both sides of the battery is we can transport this in the short circuited state. We can transport it at zero volts and connect it up and it will work fine. 
you can't do that with a lithium ion battery because because you've got the two different current collectors, there will always be a potential difference between the two electrodes. And that's one of the safety issues with transporting lithium ion. But the good thing is, the operating principles are much the same. And how you make them, the f battery formats you're going to use are going to be the same as lithium ion. So we view it as basically a drop-in technology. So we can use existing manufacturing techniques. What are we going to use it for? Key applications that have been highlighted, replacing lead acid for things like starting lighting ignition, work well for that. Larger diesel generators, uh, you could replace with sodium ion, and then things like grid storage, where you're going to have big batteries, therefore you want low cost materials. And it's seen as being a very important uh, technology for <laughs> developing countries. If any of you have been to Delhi, it has huge pollution problems. It also has an awful lot of three-wheeler auto rickshaws, which produce a lot of pollution. Sodium ion would be an ideal solution for powering an auto rickshaw, for example. Um, I'm going to move swiftly on, past that slide. But we're not just limited to those applications. Because lithium ion phosphate is now achieving such success for automotive uses, well, sodium ion is seen as a direct competitor for lithium ion phosphate. So now we can think about, well, actually, we could use sodium ion for electric vehicles as well. So this is an electric vehicle produced by a sodium ion company Hainar in China, which is a spin-out from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. <laughs> so we have Renault partnering a Chinese firm to make an electric vehicle uh, powered by sodium ion. And the UK company Faradian, who style themselves as the world's leading <coughs> sodium ion company. More on them later. They also see medium range electric vehicles as a possible application. What are we doing in St Andrews? I've got to that finally. Um, well we lead a project called Next Gen, well Next Generation Sodium. Uh, fund funded by the Faraday Institution, which has become the UK's leading funder of battery research. And we're looking at basically the whole thing for sodium ion. Some of the other Faraday Institution projects look at very specific aspects like the cathode material for lithium ion or mechanisms by which lithium ion batteries degrade and so on. But because this is New technology, we're looking at the whole thing. So we've got six academic partners, St Andrews, Imperial, Lancaster, Cambridge, uh, Birmingham, and STFC. <coughs> so we're looking at all aspects of the battery, the electrode materials, the electrolyte, uh, the interface, which is, it's not my thing, I'm not gonna talk about it this evening, but it's very important, particularly the interface between the electrolyte and the negative electrode uh, because the electrolyte tends to decompose on the surface of the negative electrode. And we're also looking at scaling up to patch cell size and going back. This is a mock-up of a scale-up facility <coughs> which had its official opening uh, last month at Garbridge near St Andrews the university's Eden campus. Mm. So this is what we're looking to do, produce. We also have a number of partners, 
Anti Power up in Thurso, Derek Alera in South Wales, who make carbon negative electrodes, and I've already mentioned them, Faradian, uh, who, make, who are developing sodium ion. Sadly, Faradian are no longer a British company. They've been bought out by Reliance, an Indian company. Um, they're still based in the UK, and all their R and D's done done here. But uh, the Indians hold the purse strings. That's a sad indictment of British industry. There we are. So we're looking to combine the best positive electrodes we can make on the project, the best negative electrodes, new electrolytes. Because one of the things I'll show you. Bits about the electrode materials. The electrolytes, mostly what people are using are sodium analogues are the ones that people use mm -hmm. for lithium. And that's not necessarily the best solution. But, and then looking at how to make large quantities of material and turn them into all next gen power cells. Now I've talked about the similarities of sodium and lithium, there are several key differences, some of which work in our favour, some of which not so much. Positive electrodes, if we look at layered materials, there's one structure type for <coughs> lithium ion, and it's this one, so called O3, so octahedral alkali metal and transition metal oxygen layers and they have what's the oxygen stack in a form that's called A, B, C. And that's all you can have for lithium. But sodium is bigger. It can also adopt a trigonal prismatic coordination. That means that the transition metal oxygen layers can stack in different ways. So we've got what's called a P2 which have A, B, B, A stacking and P3 which is a, B, B, C stacking. So, if you're a chemist, solid state chemist making materials, yeah. suddenly we've got a much bigger playground to operate in. If we look at positive electrode, you notice I talked about lithium ion phosphate as an iron material. You can't do work with a lithium ion oxide layered material. Not, you can't make it directly, and when you make it indirectly, you can't take the lithium out. It's not much use. With sodium, you can. Now, sodium ion oxide itself is not that great. I'll show you a bit what goes wrong with that later. But you can use iron in your layer <coughs> materials. So that's a, that's a big advantage in terms of cost. Now for one of the downsides, we can't use graphite as a negative electrode because we can't insert sodium between the layers. So what we use instead is what's called hard carbon, which is amorphous. We can make it quite cheaply, <coughs> pyrolyzed sugar, pyrolyzed biomass in all its manifestations, some of them nicer than others. Uh, Things like coconut husks are quite good, actually. Uh, but, as I mentioned, it doesn't form alloys with aluminium, so we can use aluminium both sides as the current collector. For the positive electrode, instead of two main types, layered, which I'll talk quite a bit about, and polyanions like lithium ion phosphate, we've got a new class called Prussian blue analogs. And that comes from this sort of compound, sodium ferrocyanide, or ferrocyanide in this case, which has this fairly open cage-like structure built of uh, with sodium in the cavities, and so the cages are formed by bonding through both the carbon and the nitrogen the cyanide group. And you can extract sodium and reinsert it 
about 3.4 and get quite reasonable capacities. It's quite a sensitive material to how you make it. Um, it's quite hard to make it with all the sodium sites occupied. And it's quite hard to make it without extra moisture forming inside some of these cavities. But you can take the sodium out and put it back very quickly, so that's quite attractive. And this is under development by a firm in Sweden called Altris, which is a spin out from Uppsala University. Uh, I'm trying to set up a collaboration with them at the moment. And it's got cyanide in it. <laughs> it's a lot safer than you might think it is. But, uh, polyanions, the sodium ion phosphate analog doesn't actually work very well. But what people have been working on are these vanadium phosphates with this, this interesting uh, open structures to enable sodium diffusion. Again, it work, works at quite high voltage, and you can take sodium out and put it back quite readily. And this has been developed by a company called Tiamat in France, uh, which has been out from CNRS. And they've made power tools with uh, sodium vanadium fluorophosphate uh, materials, um, but rather tellingly, they're now switching to working on lead components. Uh, mainly because there are issues with vanadium, there are price fluctuations, and if you go particularly up to vanadium and its highest oxidation state of vanadium 5, it's really rather nasty. It's quite carcinogenic. So, most of the work's being done on lead materials. I showed you these three different layer structures. They all have different properties. So same structure as the lithium phases. They're quite typically at high sodium contents, close to sodium one to one transition metal. It's quite hard to move the sodium because it has to go through the face of one of these octahedra when you're taking it out. And it's a bottleneck, makes it harder to move the sodium. They tend not to cycle quite as well, and they're not so stable in, with, in contact with atmospheric moisture. P2 and P3 are typically lower sodium contents, but the layers are further apart. There's no bottleneck to sodium diffusion, you can move quite smoothly through the lattice. So good rate capability, good cycling stability, and they tend to be more stable in contact with moisture. Similar to the, for the P3 material, they often give quite high voltages. And recently it's been discovered, uh, it's something we've been working on quite a lot, Actually, people say, oh, P3, it's even lower sodium content than P2. Well, actually, we can make P3 phases with sodium 0.9. So P3 has a lot of untapped potential. What are people using in commercial systems now? Well, this sodium manganese iron nickel system is being used very widely by Chinese firms. Um, a good reason for that. It works quite well and no one seems to own the intellectual property. So <laughs> freedom to operate isn't it wonderful? For Adian use a material that actually is a composite between P2 and O3. They want to get the best of both worlds. So it has this approximate composition which is what they allow us to show. Uh, so it's man nickel manganese and then magnesium and titanium to stabilize the material. And it's got higher capacity than this one. It's got a higher voltage. So we're doing quite a lot of work on composites in St. Andrews because we want to find a way of combining the best, the high capacities and so on of O3 materials with a good rate performance and cycling stability of P2. 
and we're extending that to look at P2, P3 composites. One of the problems you have with all these different layered structures is once you start taking sodium out, all these oxygens are negatively charged, the sodiums are positively charged, they're sort of glued together to begin with. Once you take some of the sodium out, then you're starting to the oxygens are able to repel each other so the layers move further apart. You take uh, more sodium out still, then the repulsion becomes such that actually they, it's more energetically favorable for the layers to move with respect to each other. So uh, we get layer gliding, and that can be not very reversible, so it means your battery doesn't cycle too well. One of the ideas is by having two different phases, they can sort of pin, each, pin the layers in place and prevent that happening. So we want to use materials that are low cost, because that's why we're using sodium in the first place. So we don't want to use cobalt. Nickel is also quite toxic. Since Russia invaded Ukraine, there's been quite a lot of price volatility. Russia is the world's biggest supplier of nickel. Be nice to use just iron. Sodium iron oxide has problems. If you take, if you charge it up beyond a certain voltage, then the iron starts to move in the lattice. It goes into the sodium layer, and then it becomes very poorly reversible. What solutions do we have? Well, it'd be nice if we can make a P2 material that's above sodium two-thirds, then that might work quite well. And this is one of the options used by Heiner. High sodium, magnesium, iron, copper. Quite high voltage, not very high capacity, quite good capacity retention. So we've been <coughs> taking a different approach, looking at composites. And a very good postdoc, who basically this is the same composition to within 0 0.01, 0 0.02 sodiums. But by changing the reaction conditions, we can go all the way from one structure to the other and, with, and vary the ratio of the two phases. So they all cycle against sodium quite well. It turns out that the composite material, which has quite a lot of O3 and some P2, has the highest capacity, has the highest energy. They become more stable with cycling as you increase the amount of P2, which fits with, fits with what I said. What's interesting is if we start varying the rate at which we cycle, the O3 material does really badly at fast charge and discharge, but we don't need to put a huge amount of P2 in there and it improves hugely. So that gives us a lot of flexibility in, in how we design our materials. We've got five minutes, so we've also <laughs> looked at P3 materials as well, particularly with the discovery that people say P3 is a low temperature phase, we discovered we took a, took a sample, heated it to higher temperature. What happened was we got more P3 instead of less. So don't believe everything you read in scientific papers. Uh, and we can make this compound. OK, we've increased the sodium composition range a bit more. But we can make P2, P3, O3, any combination. And we get different properties, but we get best energy retention. From a P2 P3 composite, and worst from O3 P3. So we think we're on to something. Not all applications are suitable for these low cost. The performance is never going to be good enough to compete with lithium-ion phosphate. 
So we need to put some nickel in, and we've been looking at P2, P3, whereas for adium we're looking at P2, O3. So we started with this base material, with just manganese and nickel. You got better performance from P2, P3. Not much better, to be fair. But we start replacing, in this case, some of the manganese by zinc. We can get really nice, stable behavior. Uh, good rate performance and high voltage. Higher voltage than ferradium, I guess. So these are very promising materials. We messed around with different dopants. Now, one of the drivers for looking at copper and titanium, both are said to make the material more stable with respect to moisture. So my postdoc put some of the material in water, left it for 10 days, mm -hmm. took it out, dried it, cycles incredibly well. Mm -hmm. Cycles basically, in fact, this material cycles better after it's been soaked in water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which is not something I'd necessarily recommend, but it does give us the possibility that instead of using nasty organic solvents to repair our electrode materials, we can actually do it in a water-based system, which would be much more environmentally friendly, much cheaper. Quick bit on the negative electrode. This is our carbon. It's a mixture of, sort of graphitic bits and pores. And it has, as you insert sodium, the first bit sloping region, you're inserting sodium in between the graphitic bits, and then it goes into the galleries uh, in the structure along this plateau there. It, it's quite successful, it does have issues. The, New development that Tom was mentioning at the beginning concerns hard carbon and, in fact, extending this plateau bit hugely by producing porosity using uh, zinc and getting much higher capacities. In the project, we're doing composites again, composites with tin, which may actually be doing some of the similar stuff to what zinc does in this new paper. Composites with phosphorus, and I'm doing some work uh, with organic based materials uh, which have the advantage that you can tune them a lot but the disadvantage is that they're lousy conductors of electricity so to get around that hey we use carbon to make things more conducting what happens if we mix hard carbon with an organic and actually we get something that works really well be better than either of them so uh, the idea works so sodium ion batteries have got a lot of promise, not just limited to large scale storage, which is still probably going to be the main uh, application. We're getting performance that's nearing that of lithium ion phosphate. A number of new companies springing up, making sodium ions increase by about a factor of 10 in the last year. There are plenty of challenges. One of the, I haven't gone into this, but hard carbon tends, it's too porous for make in commercial setting. You have to add lots of electrolyte, which is obviously not so good. We need them to last longer, particularly for grid storage where you want to install your battery and forget about it for 10 years. Uh, we need a cheap <coughs> electrolyte. Up until recently, you made sodium analog of the lithium electrolyte by starting with the lithium electrolyte and converting it to the sodium one, which is not going to help. But part, one of the developments we have in the project, group in Cambridge has found a low cost way of making this electrolyte. Um, we need a positive electrode materials to work better, which is what we're trying to do in St Andrews. So I'd like to thank my group members for all the hard work that they do and our collaborators. Uh, in Oxford and in Uppsala and the Faraday Institution for giving us money to do all of this. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Bang on.
own time. Okay. So we've got 10 minutes. Questions? If anyone's got a question. Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> go on, say it there. Okay. Speak loud. Speak loud, if you want. Yeah, go on. Um, the IET, uh, Institution of Engineering and Technology, published a, uh, a document about four years ago uh, stating that there'd been a startup company in America and uh, they had developed a solid state battery. Now, I don't know if that was a play on words in the sense that it didn't have any elect uh, a liquid electrolyte, but they were claiming 400 miles range, uh, 600 kilometres, and they'd even developed uh, the battery for commercial vehicle use as well, a great big one. It's since gone conspicuously quiet. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the solid state battery. <laughs> yeah, this is there's huge research effort on solid state batteries. Uh, the Faraday Institution has a project specifically devoted to solid state. It has a lot of advantage safety wise, and if you're going to use lithium as a negative electrode, you should get more energy and bigger driving ranges. There are huge problems that the <coughs> interface of the lithium and the electrolyte for positive electrode and the electrolyte, because any volume changes, you really just lose contact. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, we're all waiting for Toyota, as they say they've cracked it. Um, I think you should ask Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, any other question? Question, question. Yes. Grab the... Okay. Then I don't have to repeat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. You mentioned end-of-life function of car batteries. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I um, did a course with Stockholm University, and they put forward the view that there's still significant function at end-of-life, and this could be used in the home to top up peak requirements say in the evening when people came home from work. Yep. Has that happened or is it not? Um, at small scale, yes, it has happened, but uh, there doesn't seem to be a sort of vehicle to, so to speak, to make it happen. Uh, it's, I think it's being done in a rather ad hoc way at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yes, sir. Um, do you believe that the, uh, the the sodium batteries would be able to challenge the vanadium flow batteries for large scale uh, grid storage? Um, I think I think there will be a place for both. Um, Vanadium flow batteries will be sort of geographically constrained in terms of where you could put them, for one thing. Uh, obviously, in a more urban setting, then there's, they, obviously they're going to require a lot more maintenance than something that you can sort of make as a big shipping container and leave to get on with it. Um, and the energy density for sodium ions is much higher than a flow battery. but Flow batteries are quite well understood, so yes. There are some really quite varied applications you could have, or very varied solutions. Flywheels are things that people have talked about yeah. for storing energy. Questions? Yes? I have one question. How serious is the UK government and the City of London about actually making something happen in this country? Um, not serious enough is my, is, is my trite response. Uh, you don't have to be well, trite, this, we're all friends here. No, no, it has been a significant problem. Uh, British Vault needn't have collapsed. But... Mm, hearing mutterings that there'll be something in, in the autumn statement that might that will offer too little too late or whatever but yeah we're, the world's passing us by in, in many respects uh, which is frankly depressing 
If I ask the big question, or does anyone else want a question? Ask a question. Yeah. Good? Oh, yes. Okay. This will be the last one. Yeah. Hey, um, when you were talking about Tesla batteries being difficult to recycle and they're using that honeycomb pattern, is there a reason, is there an advantage to using that pattern, or is it just Tesla trying to be difficult? Um, the reason. <laughs> The risk they were, I mean, their batteries were made. The mic? Yeah. Their batteries were made by Panasonic, uh, and they, Panasonic were able to churn out lots of these cylindrical cells, which made it much easier to get to market with them. Also, the honeycomb design is very physically strong, so. You hear about things like electric vehicle fires and what happens if you have a crash and so on. The honeycomb design is a real help there because the battery pack is very strong. But very strong means it's a pig to take apart. So <laughs> depends what you want. Yeah. Okay, so bearing in mind we have to be out of here by nine. David is going to uh, do the vote of thanks and then scram. <laughs> If I speak too long, I think Tom will come with a stick and pull me off. <clears throat> I suspect all of us here, or many of us, have happy childhood memories <clears throat> of cutting up old zinc carbon batteries to see how they worked inside, <laughs> or sticking electrodes into lemons to power a little light bulb. But very few of us, but some, I think, in this room, have actually got a, a remarkable turnout this evening of people who actually know a lot about this subject. Thanks for coming. But few of us would have realised just how far that technology was going to go and how much more there was to learn. So I think we want to thank um, Dr. Armstrong this evening for having opened up our horizons, taught most of us a surprising amount in a short time that we didn't know before, and opening up all sorts of possibilities in front of us. I hope you feel as energized as I do. Let's thank you in the usual way.